Perfect. Okay. I'm Brian Cogan. Today is Masters of Marketing. I'm here with Ross Gates, Jody, and Michael. Mr. Michael, how's everybody doing today? I am Lovely fantastic. This is going to be fun. Bantery. We're going to talk over each other. I heard this was a Friday. This, this Friday may be even called good. And, um, you know, not everything is good and we're going to make it better. Um, so today is about uh, telling on yourself and, and, and killing threads and um it's really interesting that every once in a while you you start experiments and you get attached to experiments just like you get attached to a relationship and you have to eventually kill your thread and i'm going to talk about some threads that we're killing um oh that is not it. it's project 508 uh project 508 is also uh something that we had it as another thing um, called, uh, uh, we just closed, we just shut down a deal with a company called Magic Links. Um, and we may bring it back in an up a couple months, but I'm going to go through that process and then we're going to talk about what we're going to concentrate more on. So uh, we had this amazing, amazing uh, demo and we were launching into the voice space. And I'm going to play this in the background kind of while I talk about through it. So. Project 508 is a, is a tool that we built off of the, this demo in the voice space. Uh, and the idea is that right now in the, in the book called Traction, there's 19 channels of growth and 19 channels of traffic that one can use to grow their startup, grow their business market. This could be in-person events, enterprise sales, uh, PPC, meaning Google AdWords and, and uh, you know, pay-per-click. CPM models, Facebook ads, video. There's all these things that you can do to, to market your product. And um, as, as a young marketer, I thought of them as very like transactional. And uh, as I go through the process, I understand that these aren't really like transactional channels while the whole entire story and the context uh, really relates to everything. And so when you talk about each new medium, that comes out. I was there for the the mobile explosion. I I was I wasn't there for the early like desktop internet explosion in the early two thousands, but I could tell you about what happened during the mobile explosion. Everybody was racing to get on the iPhone, to get on the Android, um, and even at that at the time early on was to get on the BlackBerry. And so what it what was occurring was that there was this race everybody understood it was new everybody understood it was an uh, an early opportunity not like the internet not unlike the internet opportunity which became the whole like dot com bubble and there's a lot of uh, indications that this voice platform is the is a similar experience right so it's going to be the 20th channel and if i had to uh, take a guess on what channel is going to be the most powerful channel that that ever came along. It, I would have to say that it that it's the most natural channel, which is voice. So when we originally started Alpha Voice, essentially it was kind of basically going after this channel and saying, "What can you do on this channel? What's available now? What's going to happen um, in the channel that will not only generate revenue in the short term, but what's like the long term vision of voice?" So if you look at any like look long science fiction uh science fiction star trek star wars galactic uh, battlestar galactica any of these futuristic uh essential things on voice what you have occur is a computer talking to a person a person talking to a computer and getting information back and forth and that's that's really the long-term vision of voice the problem is is something that your your brother recently pitched on and shared in a channel where we could, we could share this a presentation about all the things that are wrong with voice, all the things that are wrong with Google Home, Amazon Alexa. It, it's just not ready. If I had to associate that with um, something similar to the mobile space, we're in the Palm Pilot days. So even before BlackBerry, Android, and, and the Apple iPhone, we had. Um, we had a device called the Palm Pilot. Now the Palm Pilot could do barely anything. It could barely send an email, could barely communicate. And we're literally like, that's where we are. We haven't even found the BlackBerry. The BlackBerry's key innovation was the speed at which you could type into the 
into the the interface and uh people used back in the days used to call it the crackberry because you could type email so fast that everybody was attached to their crackberry all day long typing in emails back and forth and, and then they had this bbm messenger and people were using that and it was kind of like a a sign of prestige to have a blackberry device with a fast typing keyboard um and that sign of prestige is, is actually a really really key indicator one of the problems that they've done on voice is they made it so inexpensive and they subsidize the cost so much that uh it's not seen as something prestigious to have right so you're not you're not starting with the black town car experience of uber you're starting with like a bottom barrel dollar ten dollars for a device right so the echo show is a little bit higher level of a device and uh, the experience that we found, came up with that was available from the platform right now is to use your voice in to get video out and then anywhere during the video uh, you can ask for a link or ask for the product in the video so uh, this is an example of, of an actress ordering or watching a video she said send me the link she gets the link of the product, the product goes to her phone. It's a common experience. You don't have to figure out how to buy uh, via your voice. People buy on their mobile phone all the time. They have an affiliate links, they have in a text message. It, it's a more common experience than trying to figure out a new experience on how to purchase everything through the voice device and the video device. Um, and like Ross, you did an absolutely incredible editing video job on on this experience um thank like you one, it, it's one of the one of the most thoughtful clever experiences we put this out there and we had like three different companies come approach us about um this experience that we built this video that we had uh and when it came down to it when you're trying to capture a new audience or create a, a habit with a new audience um, there needs to be enough traffic to take a large population of, of an audience and convert that to cash. Like, so if you're on, on YouTube, I know, um, you know, some of the, some of the, you have like 2%, 5% click through rate on, on a video to a, uh, affiliate link in the comment sections. That's what a partner talked to us about magic links. Who's, who's a great product and service who we partnered with. Uh, that had about um, 1,600 YouTubers. And so we uh, killed the product yesterday, or we put it out to pasture. And uh, it had to do with the downturn. It had to do with not moving fast enough on the experiment and the velocity. Uh, but this is an example uh, of a failed experiment. It wasn't on the product side. It wasn't on... Um, I would say it's a failure uh, of marketing, getting the deal done fast enough. Because we originally built this about a year ago. This was the experience that we built. It was in April of last year. And that, and that sales cycle to get to a yes and to get our first YouTuber on board uh, literally took 10 months to get to a yes. And by the time we got to a yes with our partner and our partners were supposed to go out there and basically get all of our, our initial clients and we're going to rev share with them in a joint proposition. So we didn't have to spend the marketing dollars and we didn't have to spend the sales cycle on it. Uh, essentially the partner took too long and, and we've kind of moved on from the project because the ability to capture the revenue is too far. Questions so far? Yeah, I guess this whole thing is just about killing dreams. So I know I had to kill a baby because we're killing this, like, why does this come up right now? It comes up right now because we just got an email Yesterday. saying that they're going to move on. And we're also at this point because it's kind of been, you know, in the background happening. Now we're like, oh, we have to kill it. We have to decide, like, is it okay to cut this thread, not spend any mental energy on it and move on? Because we think it's a great idea. It's gonna be a big industry in the future. Um, how do you reconcile the fact that this exists, but you, you need to ignore it for a couple of years until yeah, people actually want it and you can make money off of it. Depression. Depression, that's how you read yeah. it out? Yeah, so I was therapy. very like uh, flustered. Uh, this, is, this is my therapy. This is my, my funeral for this product. And then, you know, it may come back at some point in time. I could tell you the last time I did this and I was so sure of a product, 
um, it turned out to be branch out. Um, and branch out was an interning link linking structure on, on mobile. Um, I had, I had built a, a, you know, e-commerce feature and an e-commerce platform that I built that I was like, Oh, this thing in and of itself is a whole product. And, and it was called like internal linking and deep linking into mobile. Um, that's what it ended up being called. And I built that in 2010 and it, and branch out didn't even get started until like 2014 or 2015, like five years later. And, um, basically what, what deep linking was, was the ability to take advertise on a cheaper mobile advertising is very expensive. So if you can advertise on desktop. Um, the cost of advertising is much smaller and it's much smaller on the mobile web than it is within, within apps. So the concept here was, can I get a link from the mobile web and put it right into my uh, iPhone product? And if I didn't, uh, I'll just say iPhone for, or mobile product, mobile app. And can I get directly to the product into the mobile app with the referral codes, with the information that I need so I can understand where the clicks came from. And um, branch out is now worth like hundreds of millions of dollars, which is the technology that basically took this and then sold that to advertisers. Oh, and then there's just called branch now. Cool. Um, and uh, essentially the, the, the attribution model is based upon how many clicks and what I'm, what I'm basically prophesizing here, or I know what's going to happen is this experience where you're talking because the current, the current platforms lock down commerce and because they lock down commerce in a very specific way, you need to get out of the flow, out of the locked in flow. So a lot of the innovation that occurs um, is going to be outside the main platforms of the Google, right? Of the Google search engine page of the YouTube video advertisement or the Facebook advertisement or the LinkedIn ad units. They build like these ad units that are, that are cookie cutter experiences, but that's not where the innovation comes from. Innovation comes from the open web um, and innovation comes from people experimenting to squeeze the juice on every single click on every single advertisement on every single view to get the most juice out of every single piece of, of content that they push out there. Um, and in this experience, this, some failed assumptions I would say are that we were able to get influencers and be able to educate our, our potential product side fast enough to get a, a critical mass. And so, you know, we, we know that we would need to get to a million users a month to like raise any eyebrows at all. And then at that million users a month, we should be able to um, calculate that we should be able to generate $20,000 of revenue per month off of those million users per month. Otherwise the model doesn't work. And when we modeled it out and we thought through it, uh, we were looking at like 30 to $40,000 a month minimum from that revenue. Um, the generalized affiliate commission, it was going to be like a six to six to $8,000 per month uh, revenue share to us at the beginning, uh, once you hit the million. But as you get to 10 million, a hundred million, uh, those numbers grow exponentially. And then you can start to have a network in and of itself and you have enough gravity around your own personalized network of uh, alpha voice where people start to recognize and they start to self-serve into the platform. So this was the, the strategy and the challenge. And I think one of the things that we talked about yesterday, Ross, was the rise of this masterclass and how people are, are getting the, the, the content and, and how, how important it is to have an influencer um, of the content. Yeah. Um... There was a, there's a lot there to respond to as far as okay, so let me, let me simplify it. Let me, let me simplify the interaction. We knew through our own experiments that we could not basically push out there a non recognizable influencer and in content. Like we knew that. So we knew we needed to tap into an existing network because the cost of marketing an Alexa skill, is obnoxiously high. This is, this is something that was very different than in the mobile days. The original mobile install was like 25 cents. We were seeing it costing dollars to install an Alexa skill. 
I'm just going to cut in. So yes. yes, on a new technology, a new platform like Alexa, Amazon spent billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars getting people to just try it out. So if we want to make a skill that is brand new, you need the famous person to bring over a portion of their audience. And where we kind of took too long is making relationships with those famous people so that we could have them port over people. Um, how this kind of goes to masterclass is like, like masterclass, if you don't know, is basically a bunch of famous people teaching classes on, I don't know, like Chris Hatfield teaches what it's like to be an astronaut or um, Steph Curry teaches playing basketball. Um, and even that is an app where it's $180 to go start learning these classes. And I've had the whole question of, is it really worth $180 to start not knowing what the content in these classes are going to be or if it's really worth it and kind of the parallel is is it really worth getting on alexa if you don't know what the content quality is going to be and if the experience is worth it and the famous people is what sold me i love chris hatfield he's a canadian astronaut and i paid 180 dollars because i was like if this experience is horrible and i get nothing more out of this than just watching chris hatfield it's like worth it to just listen to him talk for five hours and try to absorb that. Um, yeah, and so that really goes into what it takes to launch this new platform and why we're moving on because if it takes too long, you only can run so many experiments at the same time. I think a good uh, segue here is, Brian, you just talking about like, when, like this is all about marketing. When you are a company and you're doing marketing, you have to run tons of experiments at the same time high level to see what people will care about. But that means that um, you kind of fall in love with those, kind of like we've fallen in love with making this. And at some point you have to figure out like what is the cutoff where I market this idea, I make this you know, demo video, I send it out to 20,000 people. When do I say this is enough, I have to be done and I have to move on to the next thing. Um, yeah, so what's your response to that, Brian? Yeah. Um... Well, this is why you have people other than just a single co-founder and uh, a support system, right? And the the ability to generate revenue is something that's like absolutely important. What, how much can you invest? How much time, money, effort? And I think what really killed it for me was really understanding and looking at our own products that we've built. Our products are super functional. Uh, they work. They promote like a ton of value. However, We've actually done a poor transfer of emotion and, and building context. So the people that know us, that we sell to consistently, they know what we're good at. They know we're good at data. They know we're good at, at product development. They know that we're good at um, these avenues. Uh, I would say uh, point blankly that we're not eating our own dog food and we're not drinking our own champagne and we're not marketing ourselves as good as we've marketed other different companies that we've worked for in the past and we need to do a better marketing job at that um it, it's we're concentrating on the product cycle you know very early on if you look at kind of uh where a lot of like early stage investors invest it's when they switch from uh, software and product hires to marketing and sales hires and so that's kind of the stage that we're at we're right at the cusp of switching from a product driven company to a marketing and sales driven company and generating that revenue. And, um, I do not foresee, we had, a, we, we had a tough conversation. I do not foresee in the next three to six months, any meaningful revenue coming out of this product. And so in a downturn, um, in a, in a, you know, economy such as this, the whole entire environment, we have to be more stringent on threads that we cut. Gotcha. Yeah. That leads into a, a, another great thing, which is just how many threads a company can have open at once. Um, I'm just going to share this also. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Uh, so just this video in the background quickly is another experience that we made. I put it out there. This got 20,000 views on LinkedIn, got 12 companies reaching out to me and to your revenue point, all of them were vending machine companies asking to license the technology to see how we could work together. And none of them wanted to pay more than, 
I don't know, if you sell a vending machine like this for $3,000, they didn't want to pay more than $500 per machine. They didn't want to make that many machines. They just wanted to do it as a test. And you can make the coolest thing ever. But after talking to 12 companies and seeing, you know, if I put in $100,000 worth of effort, I'm going to make $30,000. You just got to cut the thread no matter how good you think it's going to be. Yeah. The funniest thing that I think came out of this, though, is talking to a friend that works in Google's innovation lab and having him tell me that this was on Google's roadmap and they're not gonna do it because it already exists. Um, because this demo exists, not that the actual product exists, but the whole reason they're doing it is for PR as well. And it sounds like they're doing it for PR rather than to actually make money because they may already know that there's very little money to be made in these experiences. They just capture a lot of eyeballs. But going into the, what you said right when you were finishing, you had to cut the thread. How many threads do you think a company can run at the same time to run efficiently to do enough experiments but to not spin their wheels and have such a high switching cost that they don't perform effectively cool that's an awesome question um and there are very good answers to this um and uh if i if i'm completely honest we're not doing it correctly and so you know sometimes you got to put it out there that um you need three to four people in a growth group, right? So this is like kind of like pods, Twitter calls them pods. Uh, essentially, Google does the same thing. You need a product manager, a uh, quarter to half of a di designer's time, time, generally a front-end developer and a back-end developer of the software product to, and, and to push it forward a lot, far enough to be able to test the thread. Um, and then you get some internal type of, of communication back and forth, see where it's at. And now either generally they'll like a Google or Twitter will double down and, um, or they'll cut the thread. Right. So, and then you'll have to join another team. Um, we have currently four different revenue generating operations and, and uh, we have to double down on the revenue generating operations that we already have because we're a team of like 10 people. So before I just said, you need four people for a full team for a single thread. We have four threads and we have 10 people. So we're missing, Six people. Um, right, two more product managers. Like we, we basically have two product managers. Um, we're training in a third product manager. Um, and so we're missing one and a half product managers. We only have one front end person and we have like uh, basically four back end people. So, so we're missing about six people to be able to run the four threads that we have currently effectively. And um, you know, that's, that's a reality and that, and that's what a bootstrapped business needs to do. Um, when you get uh, venture capital and when you get investment, essentially they're giving you the money in the runway to experiment on one, maybe two threads. Um, as a bootstrap business, like because Ross is a, a, a rock star and I've done it a couple of times, we're able to like parse these things in a way that um, the context switch, the context switching from project to project isn't incredibly high, but we're not really fully blowing out and finishing a product. So Ross, you're the owner of Little Black Book, and, and part of the problem of, of this is that well, we are not internally giving ourselves and our products as much attention as we do to our clients and our client success, which is good because our clients are happy, but it's really kind of like the, um, the, the, cobbler has, the cobbler's son has no shoes type of scenario. Right. It's the marketer spends all the time on product, so doesn't have the time to market as effectively as they'd like to. They know how to do it. They just don't have the time to do it effectively. Um, you said I'm the owner of Little Black Book. Yeah, that in and of that itself is one product that functionally is amazing. Um, but because we have so many products, there's some shortcuts that we've taken to kind of mash them together so that we don't have to host three main websites, et cetera, et cetera. And because of that overlap, there's, um, there's just small things that we, we don't address that if they stood as standalone products, um, it'd be less confusing. The marketing would be easier, but because we have a smaller team 
and we steal resources from different projects and different websites so that we can get them up quicker, um, it all does kind of mash together. Absolutely. So uh, what I was, what I was going to say in, in the last couple minutes here is we can go through an exercise where um, you act as the owner of Little Black Book and I can be a growth consultant for you and we can screen share and drive an audience, um, how we're going to drive an audience in the last Perfect. couple of minutes. Want Let's to do that? that? Sure. Cool. All right. So live. So Ross, tell me about your product. So Little Black Book is a free Chrome extension. Free, not spammy, just free. You can go to uh, any LinkedIn profile that you're connected with or you're not connected with, and you can see the email address and the contact information of that person in the Chrome extension, which then gets ported back to your account in uh, a main dashboard where you can see all that contact information. So you can start contacting people via email instead of just through LinkedIn. So you can do it in mass and at scale. Got it. Also, so who, you can before download, you go into features, like let's talk about the audience. Cool. Who are they? The audience is salespeople, marketers, um, mostly salespeople, I'd say to start. Anyone who has a network that they can pull a lot of value out of, um, maybe a large network, maybe eight or 10,000 people. And if they could communicate with them at scale, they could get more value than communicating with them one-on-one. -on -one. So you want, so you're, you're looking for salespeople to commun that are looking to communicate at scale. So right there, I, I think we, we have a little bit of uh, communicating at scale is, is, is a marketing role. So what's the scenario in terms of when somebody would want to communicate at scale? Like that, that wants to market that they're like a salesperson that, that wants to market to their entire network. For startups? So, so you're, there is kind of a disconnect. Marketing, yes, marketing at scale is marketers. A salesperson at scale might be like if they are running a startup and they have their own team and they are pivoting their company and they want to ask everyone who has a vested interest in them whether or not the pivot's a good idea as a way to start a conversation about what they're doing next. Okay, so we just switched the sale from a sales persona to a founder persona. So pivoting the company, right, is somebody when a founder with a large network would want to then communicate at scale. Um, I think that when a salesperson would want to communicate at scale, like they, it's when they change their jobs and they want to tell their whole entire network. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So essentially, let's just take this persona about total addressable market, salesperson, little black book, and, and let's go onto LinkedIn and let's figure out what – when they change jobs. So how many days into a job change? Less than 90 days, let's just say. Let's see where I'm getting at here. Okay. In a second. Yeah. All right. So we know we want to talk to salespeople with large networks. They want to communicate at scale. And the use cases, they change jobs. Cool. So what we're going to do is come up with a way to uh, to figure this out. So sales, we're going to put in the function that we're going to look at our trusty sales navigator here. Um, and we're going to start hitting these people up. So there's 14 million people in sales. Let's make it easy. United States. And 140,000 people have changed jobs in the last 90 days. So uh, Mr. Product Owner, uh, Ross Gates, here's 140,000 people that we can reach out to, uh, either via manually or programmatic, and we can work with our, our, our data partner to, to grab these profiles and, and you know, feed that to them, and they have a, a way to get these individuals. Um, and if you want to work with us on that, we can work with us and work with them to help you get profiles too. But essentially we understand that there's 140,000 salespeople in the United States that have changed their jobs. And now we can create a customized message and custom campaign and context around why they would need a little black book. Let your whole network know that you've changed your job. So I want to say 
there's some other kind of advanced filters that we can go here. Let's say that um, you know they're at the current company. And, and here's some examples of, of company based. There's 886 that have joined Salesforce. There's 390 at Google. So now those are large enough audiences where you can even like tie into the companies themselves and do a company specific um, uh, target. Interesting. Okay, let's open a thread. So, all right, so we have less than one year at the current company, that's gonna actually shrink it even more. Uh, and now we're down to 91,000. So that means that 50,000 of the people had changed the job within the company itself, not, not external companies. So these, these individuals are at brand new companies. Uh, you could even make it the region even tighter. So Mr. Sales Consultant, yes, who sir. do you think would use this more? Someone in a higher level, like a VP or owner position or someone in a lower level? Who benefits more from telling their network that they change jobs? Right. When you say communicate at scale, I don't think, um, I don't think of um, large enterprise companies. So generally, the higher the, the company headcount, the more um, right, as you can see, they are in the way they communicate. That's right. So anything with lower employee counts is going to be an easier sale, uh, a faster sales cycle because people at enterprise companies have a playbook that they have to run and they have to go by. There's, there's certain uh, communications that they have to get approved. And once you get around the 500 person mark or even in the 200 person mark, I actually think 200 above 200 is, is too high. So now we've gone and shrunk that audience of 150,000. Now we're down to 37,000 people that are most likely to uh, and self-employed people are always looking for an edge as well because they have to do a lot of the services themselves. So anytime you can help the, uh, a self-employed person use a tool and have something programmatic in their lives, uh, you're, you're really giving them a lot of value. Um, I would start with one self-employed to 50 people. And now we're at uh, like 22,000 people that would be like a $2,000 campaign to run, right? So 10 cents a lead, uh, 22,000, we essentially can run a campaign for $2,000 to run all those 22,000 people, uh, generate three to four emails around Little Black Book, follow up and connect with them on uh, LinkedIn and start that campaign uh, and, get, and push them to Little Black Book. And I think that's what we should do. Let's do it. Then let's also just tighten up the product a little bit to curb confusion and make it all similar branded and get them down a product funnel. And it's free. Cool. So it's just all about communication at this point. So that's how we do a little growth exercise. And, um, you know, it's a little bit of postmortem and this isn't like the happiest episode ever. And I recognize that, but it's okay. Right. You, you have ideas. You can't get caught up in the ideas. You have to love the process. And part of the process is, is, is trimming, is, is gardening, is, is pulling weeds. And sometimes what you think is a, is a pumpkin is, uh, is actually a weed that, that's distracting you and eating up your, the nutrition of your soil that's around you. And, and you, have to, uh, you have to pull those weeds. I love how your unicorn company is a pumpkin. I would pick that too. <laughs> it's a pumpkin? It's a pumpkin that turns into a chariot. All right, weird episode today. Um, a little bit cathartic. Thanks for listening. Um, and I, I hopefully the, the growth tactic that we just bluntly showed and we're going to do uh, and probably work with one of our data partners to basically pull this off um, to see if it works. And what we should do is a follow up on our growth tactic and probably cut this into a clip and then see how, it, how this rolled out in like two to three weeks. Yeah. And just to show also that you have to pay to market and to test these things. And this $2,000 experiment, it might work. A bunch of people might want it. It might not work. Nobody might want it, but you got to gotta pay to play. And then if it doesn't work, we got to cut that. We got to cut the weed. Yeah, exactly. Get rid of that. Pull that weed. So the pumpkins can flourish and keep your, your garden healthy.
Nice. I said we end on that note. <laughs> that was very hesitant right. the way I said it. Awesome. Thanks, on Brian, that. for these insights. Uh, thanks for being my growth consultant and walking me through this. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for another Masters of Marketing. We will see you Monday. That was good. Happy holidays. Yep. <laughs>